So yeah, uh, hi James, I'm a third year, or going to third year PhD student at the University of Hull. Um, and my uh, research project is looking specifically at the composition of uh, popular music in its loosest kind of term um, for ambisonic uh, and higher order ambisonics. Um, we're looking specifically at composing music from the outset with the destination medium being uh, higher order ambisonics. Uh, so I'm going to try and get onto some of the more interesting ideas which have arisen through the project, but first of all I'll give a quick overview of ambisonics and some of the different things you have to be aware of when working in ambisonics. Um, it's, it, some of these things could be papers in themselves, so I'm sorry if I skip over things, feel free to ask me some questions later. Um, this is a quote that I quite like using just because it kind of sets the stage a little bit. Um, it's just stereo. When I write, I write in surround. My life is in surround. Why would I settle for less? I've been waiting for this moment where I can actually go and listen to one of my soundtracks without going, oh dear, it's only in stereo. And it kind of, this Zimmer quote kind of sums up, uh, in a nutshell really, the, uh, the, the overwhelming prevalence of stereo across steric stereophony uh, since its transition from mono to stereo has become the format and we have we have moved on, don't get me wrong, there are five one there's five one music. Uh, but the prevalence of listening is, is mainly in stereo. Um, so why am the science? Um, it's a very peculiar uh, but very malleable uh, format which has a lot of uh, potential. And this is our studio over in Hull which is a full spherical um, third order ambisonic studio. Uh, so this is a lift, it takes you halfway up into the room so you can compose in the full sphere rather than just the, he just the hemisphere, which a lot of uh, uh, ambisonic setups kind of have. You'll see a lot of ambisonic studios with the dome. So for example, up here uh, at, uh, in the spiral, it's a dome with top space. Uh, and then this is more of a full 3D sound field. Um, so, ambisonics itself, full space around the format, you've got horizontal and vertical planes, so you can move sound in any direction, and it's isotropic, so sounds from all directions are treated equally. There's no front or back or side, it's just the whole, the whole sphere. Um, so, uh, interestingly as well, because in first order uh, ambisonics, you have a maximum of four channels, so you can use three without height, and the fourth channel gives you height, so it's less bandwidth intensive as an output format, uh, as opposed to 5.1, which is where a lot of broadcast mediums have, have suffered in the past by trans having to transmit six channels of audio to, to the home. Uh, it's becoming less of a problem now that we've got faster broadband speeds, but uh, that was a thing in the past. And really interestingly to me, is that it's a scalable format and you can convert your sound sphere to virtually any speaker array imaginable. I'll get on to that in the future. So this is a brief overview of kind of orders as such. Um, this is just basically to illustrate that the more channels you have, the greater the spatial resolution. Um, could go into more detail on the kind of pole patterns and the, the things like that. Um, uh, again, for another another paper. So I'm looking specifically at the moment at, at composing in th third, fifth, uh, seventh order is very difficult. So a lot of this in third order. Um, so you have two main channel orderings. Um, the first ordering is first first column, uh, which is W, which is your omni-channel, X one direction, Y one direction, and Z is your height axis. Um, so that skews uh, are kind of implemented as the kind of standard, what we call B format. Again, sorry, I'm just kind of skimming over these things. Um, uh, but it's kind of a proprietary format or the proprietary channel ordering for first order ambisonic microphones, such as the sound field or I don't know whether, I haven't used the, the Amphio yet, but I don't know whether it changes the order. Uh, this is what sound works. Um, Ambix, however, is more supported by YouTube, so if you want to, 
upload and on the Sonic file into YouTube, I found it in Ambit Telegram. So it's just a peculiarity, like this is being more implemented, this traditionally has been used. Um, and so this is where, to me, it becomes very interesting. So comparably to 5.1 to five or Poro or Atlas is a tricky one, but in a, in a similar sense. Um, they're all channel based. So we have our left channel, our center channel, our right channel, our left surround channel, our right surround channel, and the subwoofer. So we've got our six channels, and it has to be in that six channel format. Um, with Amazonics, you tell the file where the speakers are in the room. So you can have two speakers, or you can have 100 speakers, and you can create a decode for virtual name space. And so this is. Um, uh, a plugin by uh, IEM um, called the All Ramp Decoder, which is, I think, really, really solid. There's another, there's another one called uh, Rapture 3D, which is by the Blue Ripple Group. Um, so, this is just an example. These are all speaker points, and this is your decode. Uh, you can also decode binaurally, uh, either using generic HRTFs or you can get your own personalized HRTF and get a really personalized uh, binaural render. Uh, where this is particularly interesting is that one, it allows the end user to move the sound field after the, after the composition has taken place. Um, and it allows it to be implemented into virtual reality. So we can move around the space with this binaural decode. And then you have head trackers. Uh, which can track your movement. Um, so, getting onto the composition side of things, which is what I really want to talk about today, um, there's certain kind of prerequisites, I guess. Um, you have to have a good understanding of how we hear sound and how our brains and ears perceive location. It's okay flying things around the room, it's a great effect, but once you've heard it once, it, you, you know, it's like the, the old adage of the Disney film. You go and see a Disney film in 3D, you'll see something fly out of the screen, come out here, it'll make it sparkling eyes, and it'll go in slow motion, and it'll disappear back onto the screen. Great the first time, not very interesting the next, or the third, and so on and so forth. So, the strategy for me looking at books going into this is to understand where the sweet spots are for positioning on. What, what are our azimuth and uh, elevation planes? Uh, yeah, this is just a bit more of, a, uh, of an extension of that, uh, taking into account how we, how we hear and how we understand where frequency is and how we're in um, There's also, I think these are some tools that we can use to actually uh, analyze this, the final sound field. So, this is half XX. Um, which is a really interesting tool because it also allows you to upscale first order Amazonic recordings up to third order. Um, and then you have the Blue Ripple Flare, which is quite a useful uh, tool. I'll just show you a quick example of it in action. Uh, so, to quickly describe it, we've got above zero degrees elevation, below zero degrees eleva elevation, and then to the left is negative uh, azimuth, to the right is positive. So, I won't play the, play the audio itself, um, but you can see kind of the visual representation of, of the sound um, as it moves across the space. Um, so, we have quite broad gestures going on at the moment in this. Um, and then just to contextualize it a bit further, um, we're looking, uh, if, if we're considering composing and surround sound, there's no kind of book on how to do it, well, there's obviously engineering uh, strategies and things like that, but in the past, our biggest kind of listening change has been from mono to stereo. And so, the Dr. Ray Moore paper looking at configuring the sound box and looking at the, um, the differences uh, that en uh, the, en the engineering problems that engineers faced at the time uh, when they tra uh, transitioned from mono to stereo. 
And I'm from an electroacoustic composition background, uh, but I'm plugging on popular music. Uh, uh, Dennis Smalley's uh, vocabulary uh, on how to describe some of these ideas is very useful in this context. Okay, so on to the meat. So, as I mentioned at the start, we're considering IO and around sonics as the destination medium. We're not considering it as stereo first and then upscaling it. We are just going straight to ambisonics and then we can decode from ambisonics to our, to our preferred listening environment. Um, so, firstly, we're going to consider um, one of the main processes, which is the encoding of sound. So, if we have a mono microphone source and we want to place that in space, then we will use a mono encoder and then we'll position that on the, on the sound sphere. So, say, for example, it's a snare drum, we might want to place it in slap bang centre because it's just what, what we're kind of used to. Um, but we can also do uh, stereo encodes. So, if we have a pair of overheads, we can encode those and put, place them in space. Um, and so you can start to get some very quickly some spatial ideas and representation from existing stereo techniques. Uh, there's no need to jump in and think, oh, I need an ambisonic microphone to record an ambisonic to work. You can actually still use the same working methods that you've used for, well, for generations in studios. Uh, so this is an example of an encoder. So this is a mono encoder, uh, mono ambix encoder, uh, where uh, the <coughs> point is uh, both, and then we've got a stereo encoder on the right hand side, where we've just got our left channel and our right channel, just placed slightly to the left. So when we talk about uh, just again to, just to show where as enough in the elevation planes. Um, so then moving on to first order recordings, in a, in a studio context, you could consider um, a first order microphone in a number of different ways. You can consider it as a room microphone, in which case you think about perspective of, uh, of, of recording. And you want it to put the audience in the middle of the band. And you want it to put the audience, uh, the audience in the audience. <laughs> um, and we can go into those mixed strategies as well. But also as a performative consideration, you could have a number of performers around that one microphone, maybe reinforced by a couple of different spot microphones, and, and then they can be placed in the post. <clears throat> so, there's been a lot of talk kind of over the last day or so about hyper-reality and you know, how we can uh, create something which can't be performed. And this is a really interesting concept within this kind of area of production because <clears throat> it's where it starts to get really exciting. If we want to replicate um, a performance, then that's no problem. We can mic up a drum kit as we would do standard, uh, in a kind of standard fashion out of eight microphone setup, for example. Um, and then we can place those individual elements in, uh, in our Amazon panels. So, to do that, realistically, we might place our kick drum at a lower elevation in front, because that's where the drum is. So we want to sit the uh, listener in the drummer's position. So, kick drum would be slightly lower, so we put it lower uh, on the plane. Stereo overheads might be slightly further out than usual, just to give a bit more of a sense of envelopment. Um, and you also have the spot microphones in front. So, Tom's in front and then we've got this imagery in front, of course, and then it. And then you get into slightly more interesting things. So you can have your snare in mono in the centre, but it's quite common for us to use two microphones on a snare drum, either on the top or one on the bottom. Um, so you can have two microphone characteristics panned at 30 degrees and minus 30 degrees respectively. And if they're both in phase, you get a big snare sound, a big interesting characteristic of, from those two microphones. Um, and like I mentioned, you can use, uh, uh, for example, a sound field microphone as a room microphone or as a spatial overhead. So this is an example of drum recording where we have 
We have two Sandfield ST 350s. Uh, one is behind the drummer's head, uh, so that would be their perspective. And then we also have one which is higher than, well, quite high on the head, um, to capture the whole info uh, of the kit. And also, as, as kind of a roomier setting, because this studio in particular has a, has a feature at the top of it where the, 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 the height of the room is increased. Um, this is in another studio, so rather than use uh, a sound field microphone, which are more delicate than designed for field recording, um, we actually create um, an Amazonic microphone array, which is an A format array. So this is how the microphone capsules themselves are arranged in, uh, in the sample micro books using some uh, cardio bones. And then we also have the spot microphones to, re again, reinforce that greater spatial image so we can sit the drummer in that position. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Rumsey's kind of uh, uh, methods of mixing for 5 one out. Uh, in the audience, in the band, and then you've got this abstract idea which we're going on to. So this this would be more used in 5.1, where you have a, a dry front uh, image reinforced by the central snare drum, and you have your uh, ambience or uh, reverbs in the rear channels, um, which is an interesting setup in itself, but, in, but <laughs> you know, to progress it musically, it's just it's just a mixed representation of, of space. It's not intrinsically musical representation of uh, of the space. Um, and so we get onto an abstract ambisonic mix where we can we can flu fluidly change between these perspectives throughout the piece. We can move the position of the listener into very strange places or very close spaces. You can have a very, very intimate chorus, very bright, close sounds, and then take it away from this. And so you have, the, you're, you're thinking, you're considering staging in your mix whilst you're recording and whilst you're writing in the first place. So I'm just trying to build this thread. We're always thinking of the output being ambassadors. And then when we do get into the kind of Composition stage, we can think about duplicating and layering the same instance of um, of things because we have more space to actually work with, more actual physical mix space. On stereo, we want to compress everything and make it tight because we've got so much frequency content that we want to fit into two speakers. Whereas with 16 speakers or a quad cell, you, you do have more, more space. So, here are a few examples and just taking them one layer of more complexity at a time. So first of all, layering multiple instances of the same mono or stereo synthesizer and placing them at different points in space. So if I just switch over to Reaper, and excuse my terrible file names because um, who has tiny sessions anyway? And so this is our synth synthesizer bus and we have one instance where we have position kind of left and right apart and then we have the same the same instance of the synthesizer uh, with a slightly different setting but placed higher i'll just switch on and, and so on and so forth and so you can create these spatial textures by just layering and uh, um, I'll just quickly skip over the, the skim over these things. So, first instance would be using ambisonic convolution reverbs. Next, you might think of using multiple mono instances of, uh, of a reverb and then warping in space. So you have different settings on each of them, which creates this kind of hyper real uh, um, perspective. Um, we can look at introducing phase effects. We can look at uh, extending our stereo, our perceived kind of extended stereo even further um, by delaying sounds and in, 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 some, in some kind of practices in this field everyone wants to keep the sound field as pure as possible not to retain it. I'm kind of a bit like let's just mess it up, let's see what you can do with it, let's see how you can 
greatly use this as a creative tool. Um, an interesting point is that your first channel, generally when you mix it, uh, will be overloaded. So you have to kind of quite heavily compress it because it contains, it's an omni like, for, uh, representation of the sound field. And the bulk of the base content is kept in that. Um, another idea would be to kind of duck the whole space. Uh, so we were talking yesterday about uh, what well, in the EDM panels about this idea of you know ducking and side chain compression. Well, you can actually duck the whole space, so you're enveloping the user, uh, the the listener in that space. It sounds weird. It sounds weird to think that, but you can actually fold fold it in, unfold it, take take different perspectives, come back. Sorry, I'll be two minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, something like using the Doppler effect. Uh, principle to in introduce proximity to watches. So if you want to have something uh, appear to be distant, you can take it away, you know, bring it closer, increase the pitch, and then take the film. Um, car splitting is very interesting. If you want to talk about this, I'm happy to chat about this. But uh, uh, you, have, you can basically split down a, uh, say, an acoustic guitar into its individual notes and then rearrange them in space. Yes. Um, uh, do you want to say, I mean, a really great presentation and okay. uh, very well explained the uh, whole ambassador concept too. Uh, um, so what what are your main, I see you're not using Spot, uh, the Ucam yeah. plugin? Um, no, I'm not. I'm mainly using the Ambix uh, plugins for encoding yeah. uh, and the IEM set of plugins for um, transformations, also the, the MCFX uh, uh, filters and uh, general effects. I, I just, I, there, is, there are so many products that do very much the same thing, yeah. um, and so I think it's kind of whatever you're comfortable with using. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't, I really wasn't. No, no, no. Those, yeah. Uh, those, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think it's such an expanded uh, market that. There's new tools coming out all the time. Um, it's very difficult to stay, stay yeah. on top of them. But what format are they in this? Uh, like Ambix, is it a BST plugin or a. Uh, they're BSTs, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. And they're, they're all free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, great. It's, it's annoying that companies like Waves are now charging like $500 for something which other companies and other people have spent longer on and are doing better for free. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, just a question about presentation um, of this kind of work. Yeah. I suppose one of the kind of obvious stumbling blocks for Amazonics is that it's complicated yeah. in the sense that it, you require quite a lot of equipment and you require a kind of controlled environment to yeah. extent. I just wonder what you think the possibilities are for presenting such music in ways which are compatible with the ways that people consume music at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I think, so we, we can work in Amazonics on, on headphones, we can do our, our live binaural render, or we can do a, st a stereo live uh, sure. deco. Um, but we are trying to in introduce at the its heart uh, an in in integral spatial components into the composition itself. Absolutely, listening back to it is is an issue. It always has been with surround sound. People don't want to invest money in speakers in their house. Like it's very audio. It's an audio file, like five one surround cinema. Like how many people are really going to upgrade to an Atmos system? Like not many because it costs a lot of money. And so this is why Amazonics I think is quite interesting because uh, I think through the development of certain webkits that are being worked on at the moment, you can upload your music to this webkit and it can then determine your, what your listening environment is, much like that decoder. I think in the next couple of years, you will start to have that. And so we can consume it, consume surround music on headphones in stereo. So and this so, is a kind of after talk to that and yeah. it will be quiet. Um, I don't have any direct experience of Ambisonics decoded for stereo. Um, or for stereo, yeah. Headphones, let's say. Yeah. Um, uh, 
is there in your experience an accurate, paper, like reasonable spatial fidelity across all dimensions in stereo uh, decoding of ambisonics? Um, in short, yes. Um, you you are best using uh, as you know large kind of open back headphones, the nice size of six fifties, a spot spot for kind of binaural listening. Um, and also you have, if you really want to emphasize that uh, listening experience, you want your own head related transfer function created um, so that you can actually properly emerge. So you can flick through uh, binaural HRTFs, but I think in the future we might have that. Yeah. So, thanks. Um, thank you. You mentioned um, dynamic panning very briefly in second from our slides or something. Yeah. Um, obviously, as soon as that happens, you start to get comb filtering artifacts, which yeah. um, for static sound source might be more acceptable, but obviously that gets exacerbated as you start spatial panning. Yeah. Have you got any experience of, of dealing with that? Any strategies to recommend of how to um, media, uh, mitigate that effect? Yeah, um, definitely. Like That's the first kind of issue that arises, is the, the, the comb filler phasing, but bad, bad issues. Um, my, me personally, I just take it a bit further. I like fiddling, I like the effect of it. And so, I, like I said, I'm not trying to create something which is um, replicating stereo. I'm trying to emphasize these, these differences. So, my advice in that situation is go with it. use the blade, go with it. And, and, and live with it or emphasize it, just 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 change it a bit. There's no obviously you can we can flip phase and, and get these weird comb filtering effects out as much as possible, but in short, there's no way to kind of get rid of it. And sure. it, it, I like to say it's emphasized in in space more often. If you if, if for example we had a speaker set up in, in here, you would have certain induced effects which I probably wouldn't hear in my smaller studio which is more compact just because of the physical distance between the speakers. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.